She wasn't alone on the stage. Not for long, anyway. Margaret Fox, aged 54, the very picture of the Victorian widow. Hair center parted and primly pulled back. Small buttons climbing up the front of her black dress like they were reaching for the simple brooch pinning her collar at the throat. Brown eyes set in a plain oval face fixed in a concentrated stare, as if straining to hear distant music. Maybe the fading echoes of a canzonetta still reverberating around the fifth-tier seats from a previous opera. New York's Academy of Music on East 14th Street had room for 4,000 members of New York's elite. But on that night in 1888, there would be no Astors or Vanderbilts peering through pearl opera glasses from the box seats. There would be fewer top hats and walking sticks left at coat check. No arias emoted across the footlights and over the orchestra pit. There would be only the widow dressed in black, tiny under the 30-foot proscenium, and the ghost. Margaret Fox had spent 40 years communicating with spirits, as a medium who could receive messages from across the veil. They would answer her questions by responding with mysterious knocks, disembodied rapping noises that sounded like maybe they were coming from the wall or the ceiling or the middle distance in front or behind, suspended like dust in a sunbeam. She had summoned them in seances in posh Manhattan hotel suites, where financiers and ladies who lunch would link their hands in a circle around a table and wait for the messages to come. And in wainscoted parlors and respectable Rochester neighborhoods, in event halls that drew crowds of skeptics and curiosity seekers and true believers alike from miles away. And on this night at the Academy of Music, 2,000 people had bought a ticket to hear the mysterious spirit knocking and to see the mysterious Margaret Fox and experience for themselves what thousands before them had experienced, what communication with the dead might look like or sound like. And she produced the strange sounds. The eerie knocking sounds filled the theater, answering questions by knocking once for yes, two for no, spelling out words in a code, messages of love and remembrance and comfort and forgiveness. And then Margaret Fox did what she had really come to do, what she had announced she would do just days before in an exclusive story published by the New York Herald. She removed one of her shoes and placed her foot onto a stool and showed everyone how those mysterious knocking sounds were produced. Because they weren't really produced by spirits. Of course they weren't. They were produced by cracking the joints of her toes. And she explained to the audience how it had all been a sham. How she and her sisters, the famous Fox sisters, the knockers of Rochester, as the newspaper called them, had caused such a stir that could last for 40 years, withstanding the scrutiny of skeptics and attracting prominent members of the educated class. Illusions are distortions of the senses, phenomena that make us experience reality differently from how it really is, which makes them an effective tool for those inclined to deceive. Auditory illusions can be just as powerful as their visual counterparts in bending our perception. There are accounts dating back to the first century of mysterious thunder sounding whenever the gates of the labyrinth of Thebes were opened, and how it was probably all the doings of some clever ancient engineer who rigged up a system of pulleys and rods and cords from the door to a pneumatic trumpet. We rarely doubt our own experience rarely question our own thoughts. Seeing, as they say, is believing, and so is hearing. And when an illusion confirms for a spectator an already deeply held belief, like the existence of a spirit world and the possibility of communicating with spirits, the result can be stunning and dangerous and heartbreaking. This is the story of the Fox sisters, the young girls from New York and the illusion that started as a childhood prank and ended with the accidental creation of a new religion. I'm Brian Earle, and this is Illusion.
In December of 1847, the Fox family moved into a rented farmhouse in Hydesville, New York. A dot on the map 40 miles outside of Rochester, a 14-year-old Maggie and her 11-year-old sister Kate, and their mother Margaret and father John. And the house had some reputation among the townspeople for being haunted. There were rumors of a door-to-door -door peddler being murdered there years before, which gave the two sisters an idea, a way to keep things interesting in this remote farm town and have a little fun with their superstitious mother. So one night, Margaret and John heard strange noises coming from within the house, mysterious knockings and bumping and scraping sounds. They searched the house and checked in on the girls, only to find them fast asleep in their bed. The girls had come up with a simple prank. By tying an apple to a length of string and one of them throwing it across the room from her bed, she could reel it back in as it made bumping and skittering sounds along the floor and then quickly hide the apple under the covers and pretend to be asleep. This went on for several nights, and Margaret became increasingly freaked out, worried that the knocks were being caused by some unseen evil presence. And then Kate and Maggie discovered that they both have an unusual ability. They could both crack their toe joints at will, and it didn't take long for them to see the potential. They could manifest strange sounds in full view, didn't need to resort to reeling in apples under the cover of the dark of night. In March of the following year, the sisters told their parents that they had found the source of the strange sounds. It was a spirit, and they had made contact with it. That the spirit was able to speak to them through a series of snaps. Kate said aloud, Do as I do, and clapped her hands four times. And then the mysterious knocking sounds followed. One. Two. Three, four. The next night, the family and their neighbors held a seance in the house, where once again the sisters called upon the spirit to present itself, and it replied to questions with knocks, one for yes, two for no. Someone would recite the letters of the alphabet, and the spirit would knock after a certain letter was mentioned, and in this way the spirit could spell out words and sentences and identified itself as a traveling peddler named Charles Rosna, who was murdered in the house five years earlier, his throat slashed with a carving knife, and then his body buried in the cellar ten feet below the surface. Later, some concerned townsfolk would dig up the cellar floor, only to strike water at four feet, and no skeleton. And though there was no record of a peddler named Charles Rosna missing, or even existing for that matter, the neighbors were convinced. Some of them even sought out previous residents of the house in a search for the murderer. They identified a man named Bell, who ended up being shunned by the community, despite his innocence and all evidence to the contrary. It wasn't long before Margaret and John decided they'd had enough of living in a house haunted by a murdered peddler, and so they fled Hydesville. Maggie and Kate went to live with their older sister Leah in Rochester, and so apparently did the spirits which got people thinking that maybe the girls were spirit mediums, had a special gift to communicate with the spirit world. All of this could have fizzled out as quickly as it started, a silly girlish prank that got them a stern talking to and some extra chores around the house for a week, except for the time and the place that it all happened. The western and central region of New York in the 19th century was still a frontier and established clergy were scarce making it fertile ground for folk religions to take root. This was the area where Mormons and Millerites and Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses came to be all at around the same time, an area later described as the Burned Over District because it was so heavily evangelized there was no one left to convert. And around this time, a man by the name of Andrew Jackson Davis was starting a movement of his own one that combined the ideas of Anton Mesmer and his famous trance states, and those of Emanuel Swedenborg in his writings about a spirit world. Davis described entering trance states where he was able to communicate with spirits. Meanwhile, back in Rochester, Leah had begun holding seances in her parlor, inviting the neighbors over to hear Kate and Maggie communicate with the spirits. Some of the neighbors were already inclined to believe that the world was entering a new, enlightened age, 
where humanity would be guided by spirits who existed on a higher plane. The sister seances seemed to confirm Davis's ideas and the beliefs of many already inclined to accept the idea of a spirit world. And so the modern spiritualist movement was formed. Leah soon discovered that she, too, had the gift, even advertised herself as a mysterious knocker in the city directory. She became a sort of booking agent for her younger sisters and apparently decided that the spirits wanted them to spread their message of immortality to a wider audience. So she booked at the Corinthian Hall, the largest theater in Rochester. The evening began with a lecture. A friend of the Fox sisters addressed the assembled audience reminding them that Galileo and Copernicus had also been shunned for ideas that seemed too radical, that were introduced before their time. And though there would be skeptics, and those who believed that all of this was blasphemy, those in attendance tonight, the friend said, could be secure in knowing that they may be ahead of their time, but they knew the truth, that this was the dawning of a new science, one among the explosive scientific growth of the 19th century, scientific discoveries that had begun to cast doubt on previously held religious notions, the Fox sisters could provide proof over faith of a spirit world and an afterlife. And it's easy to see why the idea would catch on at any time in history. We have always and maybe will always want to believe that death is not the end, that our loved ones go on existing after we say goodbye, that we only have to miss them until we meet them again. But this was the 1880s. The soil was still freshly dug for the graves of Civil War soldiers. Wives still grieved in their half-empty beds. And aside from that, medical science was nowhere near what it is today. People died. A lot. So the sisters found a ready audience, hitting the lecture circuit and charging admission for their demonstrations. Through Albany and Troy, across Schenectady and Buffalo and Cleveland, somehow passing every test the skeptics could throw at them. Committees of investigators would examine them at performances, even make the sisters stand on a platform supported by glass tumblers to insulate them from static electricity, just in case that had anything to do with it. Rumors spread of secret accomplices knocking from the other side of the walls, but mainly people just wanted to believe. Ignoring the fundamental question, why would a spirit choose phantom knocking as its preferred means of communication? And spiritualism spread, out from the burned-over district. In private home seances that became just as common as dinner parties, where mediums spelled out messages from the departed using a Chinese-inspired instrument that would later be patented in America as the Ouija board in lecture halls and state conventions and summer camps from Maine to Florida that were attended by thousands. And when the sisters arrived in New York City in the summer of 1850, they created a sensation. Setting themselves up in a suite at a fashionable hotel, holding three seances a day, where the gentry of Manhattan, businessmen, politicians, doctors, and lawyers, would pay a dollar to sit around a circular table and walk away believers. All of this caught the attention of Horace Greeley, the famous founder of the New York Tribune, who featured the sisters in his newspaper, and introduced them to wine and whiskey and New York high society. Within two years, the sisters were rich, and their names appeared in every paper in America. And it's around here that things started to change. Maybe it was the wine, which Kate and Maggie had both taken to overindulging in, Maybe it was the burden of their shared secret or a desire to quit the life, to stop taking people's money and seeing their tears and false hope as they cracked their toes and told grieving widows and widowers, mothers and fathers, that those sounds were coded messages from the hereafter. Or maybe it was the marriage proposals, which they attracted by sheer force of their fame and notoriety. After setting up shop in Philadelphia, Maggie met Elijah Kent Kane, a well-known Arctic explorer, at one of her seances, and he asked her to quit the life and be with him, which she did, and then he died of scurvy a few years later. 
Kate had gone to England, where she married a barrister and had two children, but he too died within years. Both sisters were now on the other side of the table, knowing the hollow ache of loss, hoping against hope that maybe there was something after all to this idea of spirit communication. Maybe if they just tried hard enough. And in a fitting piece of justice, they were both forced to go back to New York to perform seances. Neither had married their suitors. They were left with no money or other means of earning a living. So they returned to the life. But they also fell deeper into alcoholism. Kate was spotted in bars, drunk, unsteady on her feet, and eventually being arrested for neglecting her two children who were taken away from her temporarily. A charge that she and Maggie suspected was instigated by their sister Leah, who had gone on to live a comfortable middle-class married life with an insurance broker, and who Kate and Maggie had grown increasingly angry with during the height of their fame, accusing her of pushing them too hard, working them too much, and taking too much of a cut of their profits. And finally Maggie decided that she'd had enough of it all. It was time to end this. What started as two girls playing a joke in a farmhouse and turned into a national movement, a religion, this had to end. On an October evening from the stage of the Academy of Music, with her sister Kate sitting in the audience for support. But of course it didn't end there. Spiritualists rejected the confession amid rumors that Maggie sold her exclusive story to the New York Herald and arranged the event strictly because she needed the money. Sometimes an illusion reveals more truth than the facts about how we determine what's true and how we cling to our beliefs even in the face of the strongest possible disconfirming evidence, like an explicit exposure from the perpetrator of a fraud. Even after being told that we've been fooled, and shown how, we're still inclined, many of us, to ignore information that doesn't support what we already accept as the truth. We trust our senses. We rarely disagree with ourselves. We rationalize to protect the things we want to believe. And even 170 years after the pranks played in a Hydeville farmhouse, spiritualism still has its believers. The sisters all died within a short time of one another, Leah in 1890, Kate died poor and on a drinking binge two years later, followed by Maggie eight months after that. It's impossible to ignore one additional fact, something that many people have presented as a kind of eerie kicker to the whole thing. In 1904, some children were playing in the house in Hydesville, where the cedar walls were crumbling with age, and they found a set of bones hidden behind one of the walls. Maybe a peddler was murdered in the house after all, some would say. But a doctor later examined the bones and found that some of them were chicken bones and the remaining bones weren't anywhere near a complete skeleton. It's more than likely that someone planted the bones after the Fox family had left, proving that the only thing significant about the Hydesville farmhouse was that it was a popular place to play morbid practical jokes and that things that go bump in the night always have an earthly explanation. Illusion is written and produced by me, Brian Earle. Search for Illusion Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and find show notes, etc. at illusionpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like the show, please tell a friend and leave a rating and review. These are quick and painless ways to show support, and it helps the show to grow.